Hello everyone, my name is Henry Shavenka and welcome to the ZBrush Hard Surface Modeling Tutorial Series where we'll be making the Kawasaki H2R. I modeled this piece and rendered it with Redshift entirely within ZBrush and I thought it'd be the perfect piece to do a full step-by-step -step walkthrough of how I tackle a hard surface piece in ZBrush. In this introduction video, I'll briefly go over some key points about this upcoming tutorial series before walking you guys through some ZBrush preferences, custom UI, as well as plugins, all while explaining why I utilize these things to assist in my process. So let's start off by introducing this tutorial series I'll be uploading on YouTube. Like I said before, we'll be making a Kawasaki H2R from beginning to end within ZBrush. The tutorial itself is recorded with ZBrush version 2023. You can utilize that version or later versions of ZBrush. This tutorial is intended for intermediate to advanced ZBrush users. As long as you're comfortable with certain commonly used features in ZBrush or hotkeys, I do think it's fairly straightforward to follow along as I'll be going through the process very systematically. The upload schedule that I planned would be three videos a week on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. These are all pre-recorded ahead of time, but I wanted to structure this as if we were taking a 16-week one-on-one class with me. We will have approximately 50 videos going through either one significant part of the model or multiple quick parts. If you follow along with the tutorial, feel free to share your progress with me either through the comments or any of my social media accounts. Alongside the videos, I'll be sharing a couple of assets as well. My custom UI and hotkeys can be downloaded from the description of this video as well as the other videos within the series. Orthographic screenshots of each piece we're modeling for your reference will also be linked within each video description. Finally, I wanted to briefly explain the difference between the videos that will be uploaded here on YouTube versus the series I'm selling on ArtStation. This YouTube series is more of a demo of how I work day to day, which means many of the concepts and processes are repetitive. That's simply how I approach most models. However, my tutorial series on ArtStation covers a wider variety of techniques that might not be showcased here. I hope both tutorials are helpful and beneficial for those interested in learning more about the hard surface features in ZBrush or how my workflow goes. As per this video, the latest version of ZBrush is 2024. So that will be what I have open on my screen to start with. I'll be going over some ZBrush preferences as well as how to load in the 2023 UI available in the description box below. Mind you, these are my preferences and I'll be explaining the why behind each decision. It'll be up to you how you prefer working. So starting toward the bottom and working our way up, First thing is, I like to turn off the thumbnail to keep my canvas clean and have the largest possible blank space to work with. The benefit of a thumbnail is to be able to check the silhouettes of what you're modeling. However, for me, if I need to check that, I simply switch to a flat black material. The next thing I turn off right away is the cam view. The reason for that is also to keep my canvas as clean as possible. The cam view helps to see the world's orientation as well as allowing us to snap our models to the closest 45 degree angle. However, for me, I have alternative methods to achieve those two functions. For world orientation, I utilize the gizmo predominantly. Whenever the gizmo is off from the world orientation, you can alt click the circle arrow icon to reset it back. It's important that you click Alt to unlock the gizmo from the mesh, otherwise it will take the model with it. As a good common practice, I like to make sure that the gizmo is Y up and Z forward before I start modeling. This step is important in ensuring your model integrates well through the 3D pipeline when importing and exporting through different applications. Many applications require a Y up orientation for either physics, simulations, lighting, rigging and animation. Next we'll address canvas snapping. I prefer using the shift key for that. When rotating a model, press the shift key to snap it to the front 
back, side, top, or bottom views. The important tip here is to make sure you release the pen or mouse button before releasing the shift key. If you are having some issues getting it down, you can try to lower the rotation speed found under the interface and navigation sub palettes. If we lower it to one, you can practice it with a slower canvas rotation until you become more comfortable with it. The next preference will be my quick saves. I personally like to manually hit the quick save button up top and ZBrush in my opinion has saved many of my files when it does crash. So I never need quick saves to act as often as it does by default. Over here, I like to set my max and rest durations all the way up to 600. Max duration is the time in minutes that you want ZBrush to wait until it performs a quick save. Whereas the rest duration waits until ZBrush is idle before it starts its countdown. Setting both of these to 600 essentially is telling ZBrush to turn off quick saves or wait 10 hours until the next quick save. Next, I'll make sure skip history is turned on to reduce the file size of each saved file. Also, I want to set my max quick save files anywhere between 10 to 20. This way, I don't have quick saves taking up too much space on my hard drive. Up next is the geometry tab. I want to make sure the Zmodeler welding tolerance is set to 1. This will help decrease unwanted welding of points when your model is scaled really small. For Gizmo 3D, I prefer the gizmo size to be set at 400 and the large icons turned on. In the draw palette, I like to change the transparency color to a medium to dark gray when I do my manual retopo. Let me show you why. I'm going to duplicate the star and scale it down a bit. Then let's go ahead and turn on transparency and ghost. The default white is simply too intense, especially when trying to retopple with the Z-Modeler brush. So I personally like to knock it down a bit to a darker gray. Next, let's take a look at the interface menu. For the UI, I like the button size to be 38 and wide buttons turned off. This helps me fit more buttons onto the UI, which as some of you have seen before, is necessary for my workflow. Next is the click menu. I like turning on the use sticky keys option. With this enabled, it allows you to hold down a hotkey, like for example S for brush size. And as you're holding down the key, you can move the mouse or pen to adjust the slider without having to click any of the buttons. The navigation tab is next. I like turning off enable right click pop-ups. This just gets in the way when working with the Zmodeler brush. Also as a side note, if right click navigation stops working for any reason, this is where you can turn it back on. I have a couple of hotkeys I make for certain actions I perform frequently. Some of these hotkeys I've set up for example are solo to control S, Zmodeler assigned to the number one, Move infinite depth to 2. And delete to control X. You can assign custom hotkeys to your most frequently used tools, brushes, macros, and actions to further streamline your workflow. All you need to do is hold down the control and alt keys and then click on whatever button you want the hotkey to be assigned to. Let me show you a quick example of how to set up your own hotkey. For example, let's click on Reconstruct Subdiv as we press Ctrl and Alt. On the top left of the screen, there will be some helpful tips. At this point, we can press the hotkey we want to assign to that function, and that's all it takes. Now if you want to cancel the operation before you set the hotkey, just move the cursor away from the button. Now we can press Store under Preferences so ZBrush remembers those new hotkeys every time it starts up. And if you want to transfer those hotkeys to another computer, click on Save. Okay, now that we covered my preference settings and how to create hotkeys, next on the agenda is Custom UI. Let's head on back to the Preference palette and open up the Config tab. This is where you'll be able to save, load, and customize your UI. 
To start with, let's click on Restore Standard UI to start clean. Now let's load up my 2023 UI. I know most people would go, whoa, and find this pretty intimidating. But I do think it's because ZBrush's overall default UI is very minimal in comparison to other modeling packages. The minimalism comes from ZBrush being capable of tackling a wide range of tasks from 2.5D to organics to hard surface. Since we are tackling hard surface pieces, it makes sense that our UI starts looking a little closer to other traditional softwares. There are plenty of videos out there explaining step by step how to create your own custom UI. So unless requested, I'll not go through that today. However, I do want to share some tips in regards to customizing your ZBrush interface. As you progress in ZBrush, it becomes almost a need to customize your interface to best suit your workflow. Doing so creates a more streamlined, efficient workspace for yourself. It's almost like setting up your work desk in real life. Everyone has their own preferences because they utilize or do different work on their desks. With that in mind, the first tip is understanding your needs. Before you start customizing your UI, take a moment to reflect on your workflow. What tools, features, plugins, and brushes are your go-tos? Understanding what you use most will help you prioritize what gets prime real estate in your custom UI. Other things that determine a UI will be, for an example, are you right or left-handed? Do you utilize a tablet or a mouse when you work in ZBrush? All these things will determine where certain buttons need to be to help you work in the most efficient manner. Number two, group by function. Keep your UI logical. Bundle related tools and features together to make them quicker to locate and easier to access. For my UI, examples of these groupings would be mirror and mirror and weld, or group by normals and crease PG. Number three, utilize custom palettes. The custom UI area is where you can create your own pop-up menus and custom sub-palettes. I think custom sub-palettes are greatly underutilized by most artists. This is almost like creating a mini UI that groups tools and features into a floating palette, which you can then assign hotkeys to. It helps group certain things together that might not necessarily need to live on your main workspace, but you still want easy access to. I have all my masks, selection, clip, and slice brushes on a custom palette that is assigned a hotkey. Number four, test and refine. You won't get the dream UI the very first go around. As you continuously update your UI and make tweaks and changes, you'll notice it's getting more and more intuitive to yourself. So don't be afraid to test out other artists' UIs, change up the colors, and just modify the space until it creates one that works best for you. Now for the last bit, let's discuss some plugins I utilize in my workflow, as well as this tutorial. If you find that these aren't helpful for your workflow, feel free to skip them. I will always mention them when I utilize it through the tutorial so you aren't confused. Dynamesh Utility from the Maxon ZBrush plugin page is a plugin I use because I like seeing and adjusting the poly count rather than the default Dynamesh resolution. Dynamesh resolution is dependent on the scale of the model, which then in turn will determine the poly count. I'm not the best at calculating the poly count from the resolution times the scale. So to make my life easier, I prefer setting the poly count in the Dynamesh utility and turning on the Use Auto Scaler button so the sub tool will automatically scale up or scale down to ensure it hits the poly count number I set. In my tutorial series, I'll explain this process a little clearer with an example. The next plugin is from Drust Tools, and it is the QC buttons. Whenever you hear me say QC50, QC40, etc., it comes from this plugin. This is essentially a macro. What these do is that it will set a crease tolerance in degrees based on the number you see on the button. 
Then it turns on dynamic and sets the smooth subdivision to 4. It is a really handy macro that Joseph Druss made and I use it all the time. So much so that I have assigned a hotkey of C to QC50. Then we have Ryan's tools. He has a paid and free version. I do highly recommend buying the paid version as I find it incredibly worthwhile. For Ryan's tools, I use several features he has and I'll explain what they do. The first one is his delete feature called Trash. It's like Delete Hidden that ZBrush has, but a lot more powerful. What this button does, in addition to deleting Hidden Geo, it will also delete masked areas or the entire subtool if nothing is hidden or masked. Now if you have both Hidden Geo and Masked Polys at the same time, it will ask you which one you want to delete. I have a hotkey of Control X assigned to it just to make the process quicker. The next one is Smart Split. Smart Split is so incredibly intuitive with its order of operations. First, this button will split your model if it sees masked or hidden geo. And like the delete feature, if you have both hidden and masked geo, it will ask you which one you want to split. However, if you don't have mass or hidden geo, it looks to see if there are multiple objects to perform a split by parts. If it's a single geo, it then looks to see if the mesh has polygroups. I've assigned a hotkey of Control A to this one because it's so incredibly powerful. Finally, you'll see me use Ryan's symmetry and instance buttons a lot during the tutorial. It's just really convenient when placed on a UI. The last plugin you might see me use is one from Artist Knot. But this is more for aesthetic functionality. It's a pop up menu for my brushes, alphas, textures, and materials. It's definitely not needed for this course, but you'll see it come up in some of the videos for sure. So that's all I have for today for an introduction. I hope you guys enjoy this series and find it helpful in some way. I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.